Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome students, teachers, parents, and game developers to the Game Design Challenge. Today is our third feature discussion and is brought to you by our wonderful host, Code in the Schools. You'll hear from industry professionals about the steps needed to get your game ready to publish, considerations you should be aware of, and finally, how to ship your game. There is often a joke in the game industry that the first 90% of the game takes 90% of the time, and the last 10% of the game takes the other 90% of the time. Finishing games, in fact, is quite hard. And that's why we're so lucky to have a wonderful panel of experts to discuss how to successfully finish your title. This will undoubtedly be an insightful talk that will help you better succeed as a game developer. The panel themselves will be answering questions at the end, so please hold off those questions. And for now, I will turn it over to Gretchen. Thank you so much, Renee. I'm so happy to be here with you all today. Thank you, students, teachers, industry folks for tuning in. We have an amazing panel. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them here. Um, first, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Gretchen Legrand. I'm the CEO of Code in the Schools. We're a nonprofit based in Baltimore, and we um, provide access to computer science education. Uh, and we do that a lot of times through video game development. So um, super happy to be here and involved in this today. Uh, our first panelist is Whitney Tyner. Whitney is a lead UX designer at Firaxis Games with 12 years of experience shipping titles such as F XCOM, Enemy Unknown, Civilization 5 and 6, and Beyond Earth. Her goal is to create a smooth, inviting user experience that supports the vision of the game designer. For games with an integrated monetization strategy, you all will learn more about that today, she wants players to feel as respected as possible while maintaining immersion and never resorting to dark design patterns. Before her career in the gaming industry, Whitney received her BS in computer science. And while she always had a passion for games, it seemed like more of a hobby than a career path. She enjoyed skinning her phone and modding games for fun, building her portfolio for a job she had never considered. Luckily, she was plucked from her postgraduate degree by a job offer and has never looked back. Welcome, Whitney. Ashley Guchite is a game designer, artist, and co-founder of Boba Studios, a women-owned indie video game studio in Baltimore, Maryland. She works as Boba Studios CEO and game designer, programmer, and writer. And the studio is premiering the first look of their debut game, Squirrely Roo Rabbit, a 2.5D puzzle platformer game based on color theory, featuring a visual style reminiscent of watercolor pop-up storybooks this weekend at Maker's Play by Indie Maker Syndicate. Check it out. And finally, last but not least, Emmy Sue. Emmy is a senior software engineer at Big Huge Games. She currently serves as the client lead engineer on Dominations, a historical base building strategy mobile game. She has been in the games industry for almost six years now. Before that, she helped kids learn how to make video games in an after school program. She plays video games daily, and when she's not playing video games, she's learning more about cooking and baking. Welcome, all three of you. So if you could, first, to kick us off here, can you talk about your very first experience shipping a game? What were the highs and what were the lows? I guess Emmy, I'll go I'm gonna first. Take it off with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. So the funny thing about it is that in my whole time in the industry, I've never shipped a game like from beginning to end. Uh, I joined Dom Big Huge Games shortly after Dominations had launched um, in globally. Uh, it was like a month afterwards. But since then, I treat every single release as a, as a, um, you know, a ship on its own. So the first time of shipping a new release after actual launch was, um, it was very interesting because <laughs> We were in this mobile space that we weren't quite aware of, you know, what were the pitfalls that we had to uh, watch out for. So it was very exciting to be able to ship something. And then later on, the honeymoon quickly crashes, comes crashing down as we find out, oh my God, there's so many bugs that we had to fix. 
Um, but just enjoy, you know, the shipping process because every single time that you ship a game, it's it's hard work that you're presenting to everybody, to the whole wide world. And being proud in what you just shipped is always great. And then, you know, take a step back and see, is there something that you can fix so that players, more players can enjoy your game? I love that advice. There's always going to be bugs, right? So just take a deep breath after you <laughs> shift it and then come back the next day and fix the bugs. <laughs> Thanks, nope. Emmy. I think I have a similar experience with Emmy. Um, my team, we've made uh, a lot of games together, but we haven't actually like shipped one um, for release yet. We've done a lot of, um, you know, launching free demos online for people to try out. And um, with that, we've done a lot of like laying the groundwork so that when we ship a game, we want to create a platform that we can launch into, you know, us being an indie studio, we don't want to just, you know, spring a title out there and have it out without people knowing who we are yet. Um, and so I think I would echo with, you know, really enjoying that journey of uh, what it's like to ship it because um, a huge part of us, you know, making games and being interactive is that you know, we get out there and we want to interact with the players in the community uh, and use that so we can have people like looking and seeing our game and knowing what it's going to be like when you ship it. Uh, it gives a lot more like certainty and helps, you know, of course, there's always going to be bugs, but, you know, the more that you can, you know, get out there and see what it's like when other people are looking at it, uh, you can have a little bit more control over that you know, figure out what it is that you need to do and just uh, make sure that your game is always putting its best foot forward. Yeah, um, I don't, I kind of don't know where to start. I think um, for me, Civ 6 was the first like really big game that I shipped. Um, I shipped some work in Civ 5, but Civ 6 is when I was like a lead UI designer and I had like a lot more responsibility and that kind of thing. Um, and there were a lot of things about shipping that game as like my first really big title that were very scary. Um, Civ is a game that targets a bunch of countries, you know, um, ships all over the world. So there's localization concerns and just cultural sensitivity concerns and all kinds of things about the game that make it just kind of a unique and like interesting challenge to ship. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed about it was there's, um, instead of you have all these civilizations and each one has its own flag and its own like icon, but you can't actually take from real countries' flags. You have to kind of invent your own imagery for each country. And like that involved a ton of research. Like I really enjoyed the process of like working with people of different nationalities to talk about those cultural sensitivity problems I mentioned. Like, oh, don't use this flower for Hong Kong, don't use this over here and all that kind of thing. Um, so like that was like an unexpected kind of interesting fun part of the job is I got to do a bunch of like learning in the process of making the game. The best moment hands down for me, and I think I think a lot of folks for shipping a game is to see your art on a shelf, like to walk into a GameStop or whatever and see like civilization or like open up your iPhone and see, hey, there it is, it's on the front page. Like there is nothing like seeing it in the coolest thing ever is seeing someone else playing your game like in public or something. That's like a crazy moment. Um, so there are definitely like things that are like really big adrenaline rushes from like the final shipped finished product. Um, in terms of difficulties, I would echo some of the other things folks have already said about um, you know, the, the trying to lock down all the bugs and get everything fixed, like in the run up to what we call ZBR or zero bug release, um, that's where everyone is just piled on, trying to fix as many bugs as they possibly can. We're all working hard, so a lot of us are staying late, and you know, trying to get my bug count up above yours and stuff, just like closing as many, always be closing um, as many bugs as possible. That is both really hard and oddly kind of a fun adrenaline rush if you don't have other responsibilities like kids or something. <laughs> like, um, I haven't done a ZBR run with kids yet, so we'll see how that goes. But anyway, um, it's fun when you can just like pour yourself into it. And then um, the other thing that becomes like, that is a little bit difficult is it's not, it's not just ZBR or 
released to manufacture anymore. Like your job doesn't end there. Like most games at this point do a day zero patch or a day 30 patch. So like even when you're writing discs and getting your game out the door, you're always working for the next thing. And you know, it, it'll, it never really ends is like both a blessing and a curse of the modern game design cycle. So. No, I love that. I love that, that feeling where, uh, you know, you're so excited to release, but you know it's it's still not done. You still have you still have some time. <laughs> That's great. Um, so imagine you're one of our listeners out in 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 the audience today. Maybe you're in high school. Maybe you're in middle school, and you've just you know you're you've been working on this amazing game for this this game design challenge. Can you talk through for some some of our listeners that that may not be familiar with just some of the steps? to taking your game from you're building it, it's fun to play, to actually deploying to different platforms. Um, so for Dominations, we target three platforms, iOS, um, Android, and Facebook Game Room, which is technically a uh, sort of a Windows standalone game. Um, each one of those platforms have sort of different processes that we have to go through. For Apple, you have to submit your build to TestFlight, and then they have to approve it for release. So we always have to wait for Apple to really approve us first, then we'll release everybody else, along with our Apple release. For Google, it's not as stringent. Um, you can upload your build anytime you want. Um, and usually, usually they do still have a review process, especially for newer games or newer apps. But older apps, if it's just an update, they'll usually just check a little bit of like, you know, does this actually meet our standards? And you can go ahead and release it. Facebook Game Room, on the other hand, it is it is a platform that is going to go away, I believe, sometimes this year, but they're replacing it for with Facebook Cloud. Um, and I don't know it, what we're going to do with that um, yeah, right now. Um, there are discussions about it, but uh, with that one, there is basically no you know review process. It's literally you just put the game on there, and you release it, and it's free open to everybody on Facebook. Um, yeah, so that's that's a mobile version of it. It's there are there are additional things that you have to do if you want featuring. You have to talk to Google and get them to approve to look at your own um, the build that you want them to to do featuring for. That usually takes around back and forth like two, three weeks because you have to tell them, hey, this is a thing that we want to feature. You know, tell us when you want to feature us. And they'll come back with, um, with suggestions of what you need to do to actually get featuring. And so that's a different process. But in, the, in most of the t time, like for mobile, uh, development, it's not as, I don't know if it's as stringent as like making it for console or for Windows or all that stuff, but I'm sure Whitney can, can answer those for, for you. Yeah, Whitney, over to you. Can you talk a little bit about the, the bigger kind of uh, more complex platforms? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope I can like give a good perspective here because like on the one hand, like the publishing part of um, the process for me has always been very removed. I have like, I'm part of Firaxis, which has its own publisher, which is 2K. You're kind of speaking more to students and people who want to self-publish and I, I don't really have much insight into that. Um, what I can say is that console requirements and stuff um, actually have gotten a lot less stringent in the last few years, the last generation of consoles. Um, the previous generation of consoles like PlayStation, Xbox, 2, uh, generation 
was uh, had very specific guidelines around safe zones for screens and like all kinds of um, UI requirements in particular that you had to adhere to. And passing cert, passing certification for these platforms could be like a process that could really stretch on. And um, each platform had different rules about how many times you were allowed to like submit and come back for cert. Um, you could only fail like three times, I think, and then you wouldn't be considered again for that game for that store. All that's in the past. Like that's a lot easier now um, because a lot of those requirements have been dropped. That also means that the quality level of like overall UI and stuff has also dropped a little bit. Um, well, I don't know if I want to say dropped. You see a, a much wider variety now of things um, in the store than you used to, which is very cool. Um, so to that end, it's pretty good. I for what you choose. Like I feel like how difficult it is to deploy to different platforms really um, depends a lot on just what you're developing in. Like if you choose to develop in Swift for I, directly for iPhone, then that's the only platform you're gonna ship on. Um, however, if you're working like Unity or um, Unreal Engine or something like that, then sky's the limit. You can go pretty much anywhere. Um, so for, especially for like high school, I'd really highly recommend Unity. It's, it's a low cost of entry. I don't know if this group has already done a project in Unity or um, I, I don't know who we're talking to exactly. Okay. Well, if they need classes, they can always check out codeinthschools.org because we teach Unity. <laughs> no, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, good I, plug, I Whitney. That. Thanks for that. <laughs> sure thing. Um, I meant to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. That's, ex that's excellent. Yeah, no, it's, it's great, I think, for our students, even though they may not be publishing you know, or may not get a publishing deal with, you know, Microsoft or something like that, that they kind of understand maybe the next level for um, for what they could do after they have created this game, especially if they're interested in going into the industry. And Ashley, maybe you could talk a little bit of, from the indie side of things about your process. For sure. Um, yeah, Whitney already actually got into it, but I was going to say um, one of the reasons that we actually picked our game engine to be Unity is because Unity was designed to make it so cross-platform was really easy and accessible and ready and built in. Um, of course, we still need to get like licensing rights uh, from each individual company, but Unity, in which is even different than Unreal and a lot of the other engines, um, has that stuff already built in. So we can basically, as long as we have that stuff connected, we can just say like export to Switch and we're ready to go. Um, yeah, and I think that as far as like steps between, you know, taking it to development and publishing, uh, the biggest piece of advice that I would give to is to remember that games are an iterative um, form of art, right? And, um, you know, we're making them to be played by other people and we're not gonna be sitting in someone's bedroom, right? The first time they take the game home to see how it plays. By that point, you know, it's out of our hands and, um, so just like remember in the development process, especially as you're getting near to the end of the, like to ship it, um, you know, changing things, improving things is how the game gets better, right? Um, I know there is this feeling of, if I made it right, then it should be good to go. And if it's not right, I need to throw it out and make something new. And that's really not how games work. Sometimes it just needs, you know, a little bit of tweaking and testing to see what specifically about this thing is giving me this unexpected result and how do I make it better? Um, you don't always wanna be starting over from scratch. And I think that that would be my biggest takeaway for anybody who's looking to bridge that gap between finishing development and wanting to publish it is to just know that, you know, mistakes, right? Things can always be improved, but mistake does not mean that your game isn't worth it. It just means that it's giving you room to improve it. It's giving you more room to learn. And everything that you learn with this game is something that you know going into your next game. And that's always always a great thing is to you know end up being in a situation where you know more, and then that can just put you that much further ahead later down the line. Yeah, I just wanna like, that. can I just tack yeah. one thing on the end of that? Like, I cannot agree enough with what you just said. Like, it is such a, so true that games are an iterative process and they are evolving all the time. Like I'm sure there are a lot of people who've played games um, like, you know, No Man's Sky or something. Like big games do this, not even just like little ones. 
the big boys have like giant failures and mistakes as well, and then turn them around. Like people can continue to turn their project around very late in the game um, and should never just like, well, maybe, I don't know, never abandon an idea, but um, you know, it's be, be slow to walk away from something like that. And just to, yeah. uh, sorry. Sorry, I mean, you, go first. Up, you go first. Yeah, the whole idea of like throwing something away, maybe it's good to throw something away at the beginning of a development process. But later on, as you get closer to like, I don't know, your ideal ship date, um, start looking at how you can tweak it to make it better rather than throwing something away. And even though if you are throwing something away, you can always keep that in your back pocket to be like, hmm, maybe I should take a look at it again. Maybe I can do, make changes to that, bring it back in. You know, throwing something away is not, doesn't mean that you didn't learn anything. It's just, it might not work for the game that you're currently working on. Yeah, for sure. I think going off of that, it's this idea of walking away too. Um, you know, I think this idea that there is like um, the whole time your game is coming out, right? And you're going to be like super pumped and super excited. And of course you are about your game, but it, it is a long process. And sometimes you need to kind of like volley and like figure out how to get your excitement back up. Um, and I think there are different parts of game development as you go through the cycle where you can be excited about and different stages bring new things. You know, at the beginning, there's like a lot of discovery, right? And that might wear off later into it because you've, you know, you're working on the same thing over and over again. But at that stage, you know, you can go out and get really inspired when you see how people interact with it and how they like work with it. Um, I think like all stages of development have something that is, you know, really unique to that area that you're in. And um, identifying it and finding it is really important, I think, before you decide if that's a project that you want to walk away from or like, you know, why do you want to walk away from it? Is it because you're getting like a little bit bored? Is it because there are things that need to be worked out? Um, and both of those things are, you know, definitely possible to work through. But I mean, ultimately, you know, if it's a project that you can't work on anymore, but um, there are definitely like highs and lows. And that's one of the challenges is making sure that you stay excited the whole time because it's a long process, but all of it's different. Yeah, that's and awesome. can I say, oh, I'm so sorry. I love this topic. Um, and like you just said another thing that I just really also agree with, which is like staying excited is, is difficult sometimes, especially when it's your own project and you're like self-motivating to try and finish it like to completion. And like finding ways to continue to um, to to be inspired by your own work that maybe you don't feel super inspired by um, at some point. Um, two, just two things. Saying what you just said, yes, play tests are like such a good way to do that. Like just anybody, like your grandma, like anybody can be your play tester, and that can like re spark something, a, a perspective that you've never thought of for a mechanic that you're working on or something like that. Um, and then the one other thing I was going to say is like people kind of frown on sometimes um, putting too much polish too early on on a particular part of the game. I think um, for like my independent projects, or for what it's worth, like sometimes I find that that's a place that gets me really excited. Like even if it's a small, smallish feature, like this one little building mini game that I'm doing right now, I'm going to make this thing like nearly shippable before I move on to like maybe something else that's like a core mechanic, like that heart can sometimes just give you excitement and that's valuable too you know like especially for your own projects um so yeah. no this is amazing advice i think that this is super important you know everything that we when, when we see our um our students in our game design classes working on their own projects that we we see this firsthand right the ups the ups and downs the highs the lows and um i think that this idea of failing forward and learning from your failures and keep and, and just expecting that as part of the process versus being really kind of uh, crestfallen if, if it happens is, is so important to think about going into it. Some of the other things I think that um, would be really valuable for our audience to understand, one, one, one of the things that we see when we have uh, students who are just building a game for the first time, they're not necessarily thinking about publishing it or 
or deploying it to a, a mobile store or something like that. What are some of the kind of legal and compliance issues that students should be aware of that might be pitfalls if they decide they do want to actually get that game into a store? So definitely look up what your game name is. Um, definitely look it up because if you accidentally you know, get a name that is too close to a pre-existing game or something else, they might come back and tell you, hey, you can't use that name. Um, there are, taking an example from Dominations, we are a historical game. So we do take real life things and put it in our game. Um, recently, I wanna say either last year or two years ago, We've had a wonder. We got a cease and desist letter <laughs> from uh, Atomium telling us we can't use that wonder in our game because they own the rights to the image. So we had to take out the Atomium and replace it with something else. Um, so Definitely be aware of, especially if you're doing a historical or real life type of game, definitely be aware of the legal rights, whether you are allowed to use the image or not. The easiest thing that, the, I want to say the easiest pitfall that people can fall into is just really the game name. That's the easiest thing to first figure it out if it's bad or not. <laughs> So I shouldn't name my pizza game Domino Nations. That would be that would be too close, probably. <laughs> probably not. I get sued by you guys and Domino's Pizza. <laughs> I see you and Mike share some humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that this idea of copyright is super important, and and something sometimes that our students aren't fully aware of. So, is, but it, maybe you could talk to that, or or if there's anything else that I might not be aware of. Yeah, do um, you want me to hop in here? Sorry. Um, so yeah, everything that Amy said is absolutely right. And then I, I would just tack onto that. Um, images are, are one of those areas that you definitely need to be very, very careful of. Um, even if you take an existing image and do your own art on top of it to try and like stylize it or change, change it, you can still fall into that that hole by accident. Um, I've definitely seen it happen where somebody like really wasn't trying to, you know, take anything, but they kind of arted on top of somebody else's art and didn't change it quite enough and it got somebody's tackles up. Um, so just like make your own assets. And I know that stinks, but you gotta make your own assets. Or um, there are all kinds of resources online um, for like free asset bundles, um, you know, unit, I think, I'm pretty sure Unity has its own store, okay, um, for like assets where you can, you know, pay 20 bucks and get like a million models or something. Um, and definitely feel free to do that. Um, another area to be nervous about is fonts. Um, definitely you want to make sure that you are using something that has the open font license or the OFL, um, also sometimes called the SIL license. Um, the Google Font Project is a really good place to go for this. Easy to remember, Google Fonts. That's all you gotta know, um, because every single one of those fonts in that library has the OFL license and you are completely free and clear to use those fonts. Those are the that's biggest. That's awesome, what a great resource. That's, that's an awesome one. Ashley, anything you can think of, anything you guys have come up against as you've been deploying? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the first thing that I would say uh, as far as all of like the legal stuff is um, I think, and I don't know how this is with you guys in the AAA scene, um, but I imagine that it's pretty similar because we're all, you know, we're all different types of artists. Um, but I think a lot of times people hear the word like contract and legality and things like that and think of it as like a dirty word. Um, and I think it's uh, good to remind people that like these things are actually designed to protect you. And, um, you know, read what you sign before you sign it. But if you're gonna work on your own game and make your own game, um, th these things are really to protect you. And 
Um, make sure that everything that you have as a decision, like if it's with a team or something like that, goes into it. Um, things that you might not think about is like, okay, so if I'm working on a team with like five different people, right? Um, I'm making assets, other people are making assets, but what if somebody wants to leave after like a year? Do they own the assets or does the team own the assets? Who owns them? Um, because if somebody who's working on your game, you know, your collective game, uh, decides to walk away, but they want to own their assets, they can pull the carpet right out from under you, depending on like, what parts of the game did they make? Did they make the environment art? Did they make the UI? Did they make the main character? Um, and if you have that in a contract and saying like, you know, your studio owns that, when you designed this, it was for the intention of putting it towards this thing. That means that that project can live on without you. Um, and it's, you know, it's up to you when you're going into this, what kind of like contract and what kind of team you want to make. Um, but do you want your game to be able to like live on without your hand in it, without someone else's hand in it? And things like that are really important. Um, of course, as mentioned before, you know, Creative Commons is super important, you know, um, taking and using assets that are available for you to use or purchasing a license so you can use them. You know, we all as different artists, we want to respect other people's arts, right? Um, we want recognition for our work, so do every other artist. Um, and another thing that, you know, if you are not forming your own team and making your own contract, if you're joining another team, um, make sure that you read those, like read all the pages, see what's, what is required of you if you join. I know earlier on in my career, um, after we had started Boba Studios, an indie studio, um, another video game studio had approached uh, myself and another member of the team and was like, um, hey, I know you guys have an indie studio, but do you want to come work for us instead? And um, that was, you know, it was a point uh, where we were both like, no, we're just, you know, starting this thing off the ground. Um, like, we appreciate the offer, but um, we're going to work on our game because part of that is... Um, some contracts have something called like a non-compete clause. And if we had gone to work for that other studio, would we have legally been allowed to continue working on our own game? And if the point is having a job so that we can fund making our own game, but we are then legally blocked to make our own game, then like what would be the point of that? Um, so for us personally, that wasn't something that worked out, but it's not something that, you know, somebody might come to you and say like, hey, I want you to join my team I know you're making another game though and you won't be able to make that anymore. So it's definitely like important uh, to have those things to be aware of, like who owns what, where are the rights, um, where should all the assets go? Because, you know, if I don't own an asset, where can it be in some place where everyone has it accessible? Um, if, if I'm doing something contractual at the end of the project, do I release all of those to you and walk away from it? Or am I supposed to hold on to it for a certain number of years? So if you come back and ask me for it, I can provide it. Um, I think those are the things I can think of off the top of my head, but I feel like all of those things are often not really thought about until it's, until you're in the situation. I think that's super great advice, especially for our listeners out there who might be working on their game with friends or on a team to be thinking about those kinds of things. All right. So let, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to have like one quick addendum to that. Um, cause again, like all that's like right on the money, like, um, the one thing I wanted to, to say was I don't want folks to think that just because you are working at like a bigger studio or something, that means you absolutely cannot make your own game. Um, For sure. Different studios have very different policies about this. Like some people are like really stringent with their non-competes um, and like you can't do anything. You can't make any kind of game if you are working for that company and definitely like read on that. Um, but for Axis, for example, we'll totally work with you. Like we are like, a strategy gaming company. So all the, you know, game designers who come here are like big game designers and they want to make their own games. And if we told them they couldn't, they would just bounce, you know, like you can't do that. <laughs> so different studios have different rules about this. Um, like if you're making a game that doesn't compete like on the same like axis with what it is that you make as a company, then, you know, it's not a much of a problem. Um, so it just, just don't, don't think that it's a, it's a hard door. It depends on the company. Yeah, just thank you for clarifying print. that. I didn't I didn't mean to imply that. I just mean mm -hmm. like um, check just in case because that could be the situation. But thank you. For sure. Awesome, awesome advice. 
Okay, so let's talk to our listeners now about what happens. They've we've we've talked through kind of the the process and the pitfalls, the, the things that they need to think about getting their games out there for people to play. Once it's out there, how do they get people to play it? And if they are so inclined, how do they get people to pay for it? Or how do they make money off of it? <laughs> I know Whitney's got some opinions about dark monetization strategies, so I'm going to make sure we hear those. <laughs> well, do you want me to kick it off? Go for it. Um, okay. Hmm. I'm trying to think of like how to start this without, um, I don't want to make any sweeping statements here. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense for indie projects, for brand new developers who've never made anything before, this is your first entry on a store or something like that, to consider the possibility of a free download. Um, because if you do a free download, it, it gives people that, it's extending that a trust relationship to your buyer. And like, um, that was kind of the thing that you, you referenced in my, um, in my intro. Like, I think the most important thing about like trying to have a relationship of buyer and consumer is mutual respect and mutual trust. And this is a place where um, it's very, very easy to accidentally step off the tracks. Um, let's say you make an awesome game and it took you a year to make it and it was really hard. And you're like, that was a bunch of my time. I want $20 for this game. Well, you don't have any kind of, nobody else knows that, right? They're not gonna pay that. Um, that's just not likely to be the way you're gonna get your foot in the door. Um, another way of going about it is to design your game in such a way where the game cannot be played unless somebody does some, that's, that's like a, a paywall. So like a hard paywall of my game has direct cost. That's one kind of way of doing that. Another way of doing that is um, using something we call microtransactions or MTX for short um, to do a pay to play model. Um, so I can only play this game for, you know, um, so long as I have coins and I can only get coins by paying you $2 a month or something to get my coins. Um, so there's a pay to play models. And I'm not saying that those don't work. There are plenty of games that have subscriptions that work really well. Um, but for like an indie starting out, I would suggest maybe doing um, like a try then play, yeah, try then pay model. Um, so like, I'm gonna release my game, I'm gonna let people play it for, you can have a demo level, you can have a time gate, 30 minutes to play my game, and then you need to, to pay me my $2 and move on. Um, those are both options. Something to, that when I talk about like a dark design pattern, what I mean is a pattern that um, can go one of two ways. Like you can, trick people into spending money. Um, that is what I'm, one of those like places where you break trust with somebody. Um, that, that is a very like dark way of doing it. So you have a dialogue that it's not really clear what's happening or it's very easy to accidentally confirm something. I mean, I think we've all probably had this experience at some point. Um, that would be like a, a time when like the UX is kind of like tricking you into spending money. Um, another thing that I, I think of as a dark design pattern is a game, a game design choice that you can make, which is there is a winning strategy to your game that can only be used if you pay money. So like, let's say I have like an awesome character and the very, very best gun in the game costs money. Like what if, what if that were true in Fortnite? Like you could just pay to like kill everybody in the level or something. Um, you wouldn't play. You would just be like, just stinks and you put the table in the way. Um, so that's like, that's what I would call like a dark game design pattern. Like you don't want to make it so that your game is like un, unplayable or completely broken if, um, if money like comes into the equation. It was kind of all over the place. I think, I think I got it all. No, that's all great advice. Emmy, I know that you all have some pretty specific monetization strategies and dominations. Do you want to talk a little bit about how those work? Yeah, so in dominations, there are multiple ways that we basically earn money from, from players. Our game is free to play, so we, have, we do have microtransactions, um, mostly packages for you to buy the in-game hard currency. What we mean by hard currency is it's currency that you can 
only get when you spend money on it, hard-earned cash on it, so hard currency. Um, and those currencies then gets, you can use it for a bunch of different things like, you know, upgrading, training things. Um, other ways of getting, sort of getting pennies from people who don't necessarily pay, you know, maybe add in video watches, video ads. If you do video ads, be aware that you do have to probably try to get a third party SDK into your game. Um, we use Iron Source. I think that's one of the major ones uh, in the market right now. Uh, and you know, Iron Source has a bunch of different ad networks, and you can use that however you want. You can show videos to people, give them rewards, and every video that people watch is probably a few pennies up to a nickel. Um, but that does add up a lot when you have a lot of players in your game. Um, you can also add what we call like battle passes. Those are, it's another transaction in a sense. It's still using the same uh, in-game, in-app purchasing system, but that's another way to get people to pay into the game. Give them a opportunity to unlock more rewards on top of whatever they are already getting. Um, you, I think you see that a lot in Fortnite and actually a lot of games now do some sort of like arena pass, season pass, those type of things. Uh, and um, yeah, just like you have sales too. These sales can be whatever you want in your game, depending on what you want. So we, we do joke about, you know, trying to, how do we monetize on a the game? There's, there's a lot of different ways. It's just making sure that how that monetization works for your game. Like, how does it tie in with the rest of your game and mechanics? If those two can marry together, that's a, the best way to monetize for your game. So you want it to turn people on, not turn people off, right? Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I think the battle pass one is a good one. If I uh, examine my own bank account and the multiple transactions that have been made on Fortnite battle passes, thanks to my nine-year-old, I'm going to say that that's a good one to think about. <laughs> and um, Ashley, how about you all? Are you thinking about this at all for Squirrely Roo Rabbit? Yeah, definitely. Um, again, as an indie studio, uh, we have been very cognizant of this from the start. Um, I think we as um, Whitney mentioned a lot of indies go and put um, free demos out there to earn a sense of trust and that's really so much about what we do is to build trust with anybody in our community um, so our initial demo of uh, our game I'll talk about Squirrely Roo uh, since it's what we're working on right now our initial demo of Squirrely Roo we had put out about two months after we started working on it um, and a month after that we took it to its first showcase um, so the version that we're premiering this week is the first time that it's going to be premiered, you know, since the quarantine where it's playable and we've completely rebuilt it from the ground up over the quarantine. Um, but I do want to talk about the version before that. Um, we started with showing it about three months in and before we put that final version to rest, we've showed it 80 times. Um, and what that did was it, um, of course, constant play testing. Right, we had people coming at it from all angles, all ages. Um, 80 shows ends up adding up to like tens of thousands of players. And that's something that we might not have gotten online if we had just posted it as a demo and tried to let you know, the traffic of the internet bring it to us. Um, really what you can do for your game is get as engaged as possible, get involved. Um, because your game is as active in the process of you know, being a game that people see, it's as active as you are with making sure that it's something that people see. Um, so taking every opportunity you can, do you get invited to a showcase? Do you get invited to a panel? Um, do you see things online on social media that you're like, oh, they're asking for people to show off games. My game's like that. Um, I'll, you know, pitch it here. Um, we, you know, really want to bring um, the indie community up you know, together, we're all a part of this community. 
Uh, so one of the huge things that I can recommend is, you know, go meet indie devs, go to meetups, go to conventions, go to places where you guys can talk and share your game, look at other people's games and then highlight other people's games. And if everybody, you know, is working together and highlighting people's games and showing what you're doing, uh, we bring all of ourselves up together as a community. And that's huge for what we do. Um, so definitely get involved, get involved with that process. Um, and it makes, it makes your game visible. It makes the industry in that section in your community visible. And it's, you know, when you're telling your story, right, only you can tell that story. And that's why it's so important for you to be active in, in telling that story, because, you know, nobody's going to necessarily go and find a game like the one that like Whitney and Emmy are making. So that's why it's important for both of them to be, you know, part of the process of how people see it. Uh, Cause somebody else might not talk about it in the way that they talk about it. And when you mm -hmm. are a like a developer on it, um, you know, the things that like speak the most about that story and how that can connect with people. Um, and that's really my half of the answer. That's uh, about non-paid. Um, I can talk a little bit more about our experience with monetization too. Um, well, unless we're actually running up on our time and there is one other question I just wanted to throw out there curveball style because you three are some amazing women in the video game industry, which is unfortunately more unusual than it should be. Uh, so could you just talk for, especially for our, our young female listeners out there, a little bit about what it's like to be a woman in the game industry? Maybe like one minute a piece because we want to save time for questions. Uh, so I'll, I, I am in the rare position of being a, a programmer and being female at my company. Um, the, the best thing about at PHG is that we're a little bit unusual in that we have a lot more women at my company than other places. Uh, that said, when I first joined, I want to say there was only five out of 40 people who were women. So it wasn't, you know, that many, but it wasn't, it was still a, a good number. Um, just don't be discouraged when you step into a room and it's all guys. You are awesome. We are all awesome. Everybody in the, at this panel is great. Like we are in this, industry to blaze a trail for everybody else as well. Just make your presence known and be assertive, be confident in yourself. It's, and once you like, you know, you don't even need to prove yourself that much. It's, you know, you're there because they hired you or you're there. You deserve to be there. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, have a, I have a similar experience. I, I went to school for computer science and I do a lot of programming. Um, so I am around mostly dudes all day, every day. Um, well, not lately, now I'm mostly home, but Skype, I, I Zoom with a lot of guys. Um, yeah, you know, I um, my heart like hurts for all of the women who have had horrible experiences. Um, I. I'm so sad to hear these stories when I hear them. Um, for my part, I've had a really great experience. Um, I have really loved working at Firaxis. I have never once felt like my gender had anything to do with my job at all. Like it just isn't an intersecting part of it. Um, like I just do my job and everybody respects me because I'm good at it. Um, and that's kind of where I put my, my time and my focus. Um, when I get something wrong and somebody says like, hey, maybe you got this thing wrong. Um, my first thought is like, oh, I probably got that thing wrong. Not, oh, you're against women or something. Like, um, <laughs> you know, like it's just, it hasn't ever had to cross my mind. And I recognize that I'm extremely lucky in that way. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely, I, I don't know if I'm a great, 
I don't know. <laughs> no, that's great. It's I think it's great for everyone to know that those places, those game studios, those experiences are out there and that you don't have to put up with the the bad stuff. How about you, Ashley? Yeah. Final um, thoughts. I think I'm going to echo a little bit of what I started to say earlier. Um, I might have jumped the gun a little bit. Um, but as far as, you know, uplifting each other and um, making your presence known, you know, um, I want to reiterate again, you are the only one that can tell your story. Your story is valid. It's interesting. People want to hear it. Um, you know, women make up about 50% um, of gamers, right? And when they looked at the numbers of how many games are actually geared toward women produced in the industry every year, it was like less than 20%. And what that can show you is that, um, that despite things not being geared towards like, you know, your group specifically, there's still a lot of interest. So what it means for if we start making video games for women, making games by women, um, that just brings in more players. It just lifts up the industry as a whole because there's a whole untapped market that, you know, doesn't feel like they're being recognized right now. And that's not going to take games away from anybody else. That's just going to add to the pool of making games. And that's awesome because I love games. I think we all love games here. Why do we not want more games? Um, yes. And yeah, and if we, you know, talk about each other, learn about each other, point to each other that just you know betters the industry as a whole um i had mentioned earlier that uh i had once gotten approached by a video game company that was like hey why don't you you know stop working on your game and come work with us for a while because you're a little young to be starting your own studio and um the turnaround of that rejection uh or me saying like you know i'm going to keep focusing on my studio was um the uh, ceo of the company who had asked came back a little bit later and was like, you know, women don't actually play games any of the way. So I think you're kind of wasting your time. And I think, <laughs> I think that the fact that we even got, you know, it wasn't just myself, it was someone also on the team who was also a woman, you got the offer in the first place show, you know, that's not true because you wanted us here, you're acknowledging my presence. So why are you, you know, putting me down, right? Um, there's yeah, definitely and I think, enough space for us. I think you're absolutely right, right? I mean, that statistic that 50% of, of all gamers are women, just like, you know, kind of the population, is super important, right. which is why we need more women in the industry. And with that, I'm going to say thank you to all of you amazing women for participating in this panel today. I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for any of the questions that came up from our audience. So, Renee, would we you mind? We do have time Yay. for those questions. Uh, so the first question, we're just gonna go in order, we have four, hopefully we can get through them all, is what is the best advice that you could give to someone in school working on their uh, BA in game design and someone that hasn't fully decided if they wanna be a QA tester, <laughs> level designer, or gameplay designer? And what do you think is the best way to get their first job? I think it really depends, like I'm going to address the how do you get your first job. It really depends on what you want to do. Um, the old way of, of saying that, oh, I'm going to go into QA first and then I'll be able to get to any of the other jobs, that's not quite true anymore. Um, I, came, I came to BHG straight out of college and I got a degree in programming. So I skip the whole cure process. So really like think about what you want to do and go for that. Also, definitely if you go to college, definitely go for a, a degree that will help you there. So obviously programming, computer science. Yeah, I um, totally, exactly what you just said. Um, I, I would also add, um, I think the the, Asker said um, they were already in like a game design curriculum. Um, the one thing I would add to that is, I mean, I, I kind of referenced this earlier, like this is very much a meritocracy, you know, like if you went to a college for game design, that's great. If you 
went and got like a postgraduate degree, that's cool. If you didn't go to college at all, that's also fine because it all really depends on just what can you do and what have you done. Um, so if you come to a studio with basically like, here's my game design curriculum projects and my website that has it, um, you know, we'll look at them and I'm sure they're nice and cool and everything like that. But what people are really looking for because it is abundant in our industry is passion. Like people, the people, I, I have a feeling that everyone on this panel has probably done personal projects because we are passionate about games. Like we care a lot about them. Like we play them outside of work. We enjoy playing them. We enjoy making them. Um, and we enjoy just like the part of our job that we do. You know, if you're a programmer, maybe you do coding on the side. If you're an artist, maybe you draw all the time. If, you know, so if you're like a level designer or whatever, show us some cool mods that you've made, show us some cool levels that you've constructed, you know, like that are outside of your, of your normal, like just curriculum stuff and like present it. Like think about like, how can I, this is just like the, the consumer um, relationship that I was talking about earlier. Like how do I establish trust with this person who I want to buy this commodity? Like, and the way to do that is to show show as much work and what you can do and think of creative ways to show that stuff off um, because that's the first thing you see before you ever get anything else. Portfolios are so important and, and that's why I hear time and time again. Uh, so great, great answers. Uh, the next question, I, I know this was slightly answered before, is, is there a good way to find non-copyrighted music or assets to use in your game or prototype? I don't want to be all in this one. Unity Asset Store. <laughs> 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 Unity Asset Store. Okay. Yeah. Asset stores are great. <laughs> That's fine. Um, the next one is, uh, if you do not want to le release uh, a free game, how do you determine how much a game should be worth? How much time you've put into it, <laughs> the perceived value, or the play length and replayability? That's a tough one. I think those are all like really good variables to like have in that equation as you try and figure it out. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, what can I, what is the, what is the trust relationship again? Like, what am I, what is someone, what do I expect my average user to get out of my game? Are they going to get, I, I'd say like playtime is a very, very big part of that to me personally. Um, like when I, when I'm looking on a store and like browsing for a game, I think how long am I going to play this? Is this like, so that's, that's definitely one of those things. But on the other hand, there are plenty of games that are like maybe a, you know, a three hour long experience, but it's artistic, like, and it's beautiful. And it's something that somebody just like poured themselves into. Um, so like determining the worth for your project is kind of something that is very personal, I feel like to, to every developer. And it really comes down to like, how are you going to convey that and market it and get somebody interested enough in it to like try and, and have that transaction. So I'm gonna like pivot the question slightly to say that this it's more about like what you say your game is and how, what your game actually is. Those two things have to like be really, really well aligned and you have to be very clear about your messaging so that when somebody is purchasing your game, they aren't thinking they're getting something that they're not getting in actuality. So you can say my artistic experience is worth, you know, $20 or whatever. And, but you have to then show that to the player, like show that to somebody before they actually make the transaction, like give them a lot of examples of your artwork and, you know, maybe take out a cutscene from your game and show that as well. Um, but like, just try and, and make sure that your presentation matches like what someone's actually getting. And then that's, and then determining that exact number that's on, that's kind of on you. Yeah. I think in addition to that, um, because of course all of like the work and the hours and everything, the number of people that have worked on it, um, that all feeds into how much a game costs. But if you're looking to figure out what your game might be worth, um, check out games that are similar to your game. Similar in length, similar in genre, similar in the number of players they expect, same thing with the system. Um, because in the you know fortunate, unfortunate part of this is that other games do weigh into how much your game, you know, what your game needs to be valued at. Um, if I am very used to getting a game of this genre for like $15, I'm 
I'm probably not going to spend $50 on a game of the exact thing. Um, and yeah, that's, it gives you a good goalpost to see what it is that you can value your game at. Um, something to remember is that when you put your game on sale, you're showing what the real value of your game is. And, um, that value is very often like your, you know, your baseline, you don't want to drop it below the sale price because that might mean that you're going to be at a loss. Um, and so one thing to remember too, is are you going to put your game on sale often before you price it? Because if you are, you know, you're going to want to have that at a price above that. If you're not, then just leave it at whatever its value is because people do watch, notice what games are going to go on sale and then they do wait. Um, and I have one more point to that. Sorry. Um, the other thing too, is that it is very important to value your game at what your game is worth. Because when you undercut yourself, you undercut every other artist who sells there. Um, we have something right now going on, and maybe we're getting out of it, um, but it's been going on for the past several years in the indie scene on roguelikes, um, where they're really undervalued because one game that got really popular in that genre was made by somebody who, with the best intentions, was like, I'm making this game and I love it. And I had real success with my game before that. I don't need the money. And he undercut the price of his game. And since then, every other indie roguelike game does not sell above the price that he put. Um, so it's really important to remember that you're not just valuing your game for yourself. You're making sure that people know that the art that you're making, your genre, your industry, it's worth it. Wonderful points. Point. Wonderful points. Uh, I know we're a little over time, but there's one last question, if you'd be willing, and that's um, how can men help in making more space for women and making the game industry overall more inclusive? It's a big one, I know. I would start with um, just giving women respect in the room. Right. Um, if a woman pitches an idea, you know, think about it before you say no. Um, be aware of not, you know, just talking over her instead. Um, that's something that happens often. Um, if you are in a space where um, I know this um, great developer and he went to a conference a few years ago where um, this woman had given a presentation and he was, send, he was standing in a group with other developers and like hearing things that they said about her afterwards. He was like, hey guys, you know, she just gave this big presentation. Um, she's obviously a professional in our industry. She's great at what she does. Let's not do that. Um, so, you know, being proactive and um, proactive in holding others accountable, holding yourself accountable. It's okay to make mistakes, right? But um, learning from that being able to learn from that, but to offer everybody that respect and continue to pass it on uh, is really, you know, what's going to help elevate women's voices uh, from the perspective of like what outsiders can do. That's really helpful if you just take the time to listen. Yeah, I, I would also add to that, um, you know, like part of making making space is um, sharing, I think sharing interests, you know, um, like I think, Kind of by default in high school and stuff i i don't really remember like my my friends like engaging with the women about the games they were playing and stuff because i think there was just an assumption in their minds that they wouldn't be interested or you know that they're they're not into games so like, they're not going to want to know about this um when in fact like yeah they totally will like see if like if you've got like a destiny group that meets every night or something then like consider inviting your female friends to like play and maybe they'll say no um or maybe they won't like maybe they'll jump onto apex with you or whatever and, and play a few rounds um and then like it kind of starts with just like it becoming like this normal thing like we all do it and we all play games and maybe you strike up this conversation and your female buddy is like no oh, i don't play anything other than project makeover on my iphone or whatever that's a legitimate game like it's got things about it that are interesting that you can engage and talk about, like strike up a conversation about puzzle games. Um, you know, like just because something is like not a genre that you've played before doesn't mean that it's stupid and girly or whatever. Um, definitely just kind of try and keep an open mind about 
what everyone plays and why they play it. Like we're all, we're all getting dopamine from the same stuff, you know? <laughs> we're all human. I'll play Destiny with you, but I'll also talk to you about Love Nikki Dress Up Queen, because I spent far too much time playing that mobile game. Legit. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for so much for, for joining us today. It was absolutely wonderful to hear your expertise about finishing and shipping a title, which we all know is an extremely difficult task. So hearing your insight and expertise was really enlightening and uh, it's been a true pleasure. So, so thank you all so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, that's it for uh, the Game Design Challenge talk today. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day or evening, depending on your time zone. Take care. Bye. Thank you.